Yes, so today I will talk about space weather. And my subtitle, Magnetism Matters, it's basically a very straightforward talk. I'm going to say, try to convince you space weather matters. Magnetism is at the heart of space weather, and therefore, magnetism matters. So space weather, just like in, in terrestrial weather, a hurricane can come in the form of rain and wind and floods. Space weather can come in different forms, in the form of light, plasma, and particles coming from the sun to the Earth. The first is the light. This is the solar flare, and it comes quite quickly to the Earth at the speed of light, a little more than eight minutes. And a flare, as you see here, is in, a, in an active region on the sun. This is in an extreme ultraviolet wavelength. There's Earth to scale on the left, so you can see how big these things are. And when it gets to the Earth, it can cause all sorts of problems. For example, radio blackouts. It can uh, be a contributor to drag on satellites. And generally, the day side, the side facing the sun, can have problems with navigation and satellites. The second form of space weather is plasma. These are protons and electrons that are always streaming out from the sun in the form of a solar wind. But sometimes the wind can have gusts. And these originate at the sun as these coronal mass ejections, which is what we see here, or CMEs. And one of, one of these reached the Earth approximately one to four days, depending how fast they were going. They set up geomagnetic storms, which can cause problems for power grids. It can uh, cause uh, problems in the ionosphere, affect navigation, and of course, aurorae, which is the nice side of space weather. The third form is radiation, particles. Uh, particles accelerated to relativistic speeds, near relativistic speeds. They get here from anywhere from 10 minutes to a few hours. And they can cause all sorts of problems at the Earth in terms of radiation storms. If you're an astronaut, unfortunately, outside the protection of the Earth's atmosphere, or even worse, its magnetosphere, you have a serious vulnerability to radiation. And satellites are vulnerable to these radiation. They can damage them. You can also have problems with navigation again and communication. So space weather happens every day. Um, you can see it out your window if you're on the space shuttle. Um, and it's truly spectacular as you zoom over. Uh, it can be going on in, a, in, a, in just the sense that in, there's always weather. There's, there can be rain, there can be sun. But weather, uh, space weather can reach epic proportions. I think I have to, damn, sorry. That didn't work. Sorry about that. There we go. Space weather can reach epic proportions when it gets to the state of a superstorm. So a superstorm can occur, maybe think 100-year floods here, OK? A superstorm, uh, if you imagine this island was Hawaii and you were seeing an aurora reaching all the way down to Hawaii, this is what we mean by a superstorm. Um, the most uh, memorable of them is the so-called Carrington storm, which happened in 1859. And at the time, the most significant technology were telegraphs. And telegraphs. Uh, People in telegraph uh, offices saw sparks on the telegraph wire, which uh, caused fires within the offices. This, is a, um, this was caused by a flare that was visible by the astronomer Carrington. Luckily, even these superstorms are we are protected greatly by the Earth's magnetic field. It acts as a shield. So everything the sun throws at us, the Earth is protected by, by its atmosphere and by its magnetic field. Unfortunately, that shield can break. And what can happen if the magnetic field is coming towards the Earth and it's pointing in a direction which is opposite to that at the front of the Earth's magnetic field? It breaks the magnetic fields and they wrap around, tapping into the energy that's stored in the Earth's own magnetic field. These, in turn, can send energy racing down the magnetic field lines to the poles, creating aurorae, but also creating geomagnetic activities, power grid failures, et cetera. The good news is we generally see these storms coming in advance because we see them at the sun, and the ones that cause the geomagnetic activity can take anywhere from one to four days to get there. Uh, so we see they're, them leaving the sun, and we can track them. And we're getting pretty good at predicting when they're going to arrive, how fast. The bad news is we are nowhere near as good at predicting the direction of the magnetic field, which, as I said, is what matters when it comes to being able to break that shield that protects us. This news story uh, warned of an alert, and it turned out to be a dud when it arrived at the Earth because the direction was in the, in the wrong direction. So that direction, which way the magnetic field is pointing, has its origins back at the sun in the twists and the tangles of the magnetic field in the sun's outer atmosphere, or the corona. So what we need to do to know what the direction is is 
first of all, to observe it better. And we want to build a big telescope, one and a half meters, which on Hawaii, which would be able to observe the coronal magnetism to an extent that's never been done before. And that's the first step. But I emphasize it's the first step. <laughs> because it's all very well to have a big light bucket and gather photons. But if your ultimate goal is to forecast BZ, you need a strategy of how you get from that first phase to the third phase. How do you use the new observations? And so what we're really working on now in advance of these new observations is developing methods that take the observations, combine them with big global 3D models, and use data science to effectively incorporate the data into the models and get a reasonable prediction of what's going to happen. Thank you very much.